Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Palm Coast Bible Church. It's so good to see you here this morning. Those of you that are joining us online, welcome, and we're so glad to have you here with us today. And we just ask that you would join in and participate in everything that we do, just like you were here with us. Um, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, there's a few things you need to know about this morning. Um, if you're with us for the very first time, there's a QR code for those of you that are live here in the uh, worship gathering um, on the back of the seats. Or you can just scan the one on the screen. Um, if you just take out your phone, your smartphone, open your uh, camera, scan that. It's going to take you to a page where you can connect with us. It'll collect some information. You can ask us questions. Those of you that are regular members and are here all the time, you can also use that same QR code. Uh, to send us information or ask questions um, or get information that you need. And then I also want to remind you that Growth Track will be starting up soon. If you've not attended Growth Track, this is a great way to get involved here at Palm Coast Bible Church. It doesn't mean you're, you're looking for membership, although if you are looking for membership, this is the way to do it also. But if you want to get more involved, if you want to serve on a dream team, which is our great team of volunteers that make everything happen behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, uh, this is the step to take to do that. Um, Dream Team is anybody that does anything um, to help serve our church and, and God. So that's our greeters, our um, ushers, our sound team, our worship team, our instrumentalists, anybody that does anything. So if you want to find out how God has wired you and find out more about your divine design and how you can use that to serve him and others, Growth Track is a great place to do that. So look for more information. It'll be coming up um, here soon. We'll give you the dates for the Growth Track 1. And then another thing I want to remind you about is our Operation Christmas Child. You see some boxes here. Um, this is a great way to give back um, during this season of the holidays and Christmas. Um, children who around the world who are less fortunate than we are, um, this is a great way to send gifts to them and share the love of Christ with them. Um, you can pick up your boxes out in the lobby today. They have to be back by Sunday, to November the 14th. And when you pick up your box, there will be instructions on the inside, and you can go to the website there, and it will tell you everything you need to know, how to pack the box, the postage, all that stuff. Uh, so pick one of those up today, or two, or three, or ever how many you want, and, and share the love of Christ around the world. And another great thing with this, talking about QR codes, is a QR code on the box. You can actually follow your package and see where it's going, when it's delivered, and all that stuff. So it's really cool with technology that we have. But pick up a few boxes today and be a part of that ministry. And then the last thing I want to remind you about is our upcoming PCBC Show and Shine Car Show. This is our second one. And this is going to happen on Sunday, November the 7th from 2 to 6 p.m. Um, we're still needing some donations. So if you'd like to donate hot dogs or water or chips, um, you can bring that in anytime during the week or you can bring it in on Sunday. Um, this is just to help our youth. Uh, they're going to be selling concessions at the car show, so this will help our youth fund some of the events that they do throughout the year. So um, keep all of those things in mind. There's other things that are happening. Go to our website, pcbiblechurch.org, look at our calendar, go to our app and look at our calendar and stay in tune with everything that's going on because we have a lot going on here. Um, all right, Stacy, would you come and lead us in some scripture reading this morning? All right, let's stand together and let's read. We're in Romans 12, verses 1 through 5. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that we belong to a body. 
that we're not on our own to figure out what's happening in this world and how to navigate it. Lord, we are thankful that you have blessed us with friends, brothers, sisters, family to walk alongside. Lord, I pray that as a part of that family that I am reflecting you to others. We're thankful to be a part of that. We pray for Pastor Jack as he brings your word. Pray that's in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, continue to stand as we sing some great hymns of faith this morning. Uh, lift your voice and sing with us this morning. When we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his glorious beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we will tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. What a day that's going to be. Can you imagine the day that he calls us home to live with him forever and ever? Whether that happens through death or whether that happens through us rising to meet him in the air, what a day it's going to be. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die, for we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we overcome, for we'll understand it better by and by. Oft our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we wandered in the darkness, heavy-hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord, and according to his word, we will understand it better by and by. Oh, by and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. 
Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. Come on, lift your voice, sing it. Oh, by and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathered home. We will tell the story how we've overcome, for we'll understand it better by and by. Amen. Won't it be great to sit in the face of Jesus and to have things answered for us? that we've wondered about all of these years here on earth and have God just bring that into fruition and we can see it clearly. No more questions, but we'll understand all that has happened and the reason behind everything. He loves us. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me it tells me of a savior's love who died to set me free it tells me of his precious blood the sinner's perfect plea and oh how i love jesus Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that no one can bear below. And oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first Love me. You may be seated. We're going to continue to worship God in our tithes and offerings. So those of you that are here, when you leave today, there will be plates at the day, uh, doors as you leave. You, you can leave your offering and your tithes there. Those of you that are joining us online, there should be a um, link or a button that you can push there um, where you can donate safely there also. Thank you so much for what you do because what you do makes a difference, not just here at Palm Coast Bible Church, not even just here in Palm Coast, but God takes what we give and spreads it so much further than we can imagine. So thank you this morning. Let's pray over it. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be a part of reaching people, reaching lost people. And Lord, Lord, we know that lost people matter to you, so we make it a precedent to, to make it matter to us, God. Thank you for this opportunity to give back. And, Lord, we know that and we know and trust that you will take it and multiply it and make it bigger than we can imagine. So send it to where it needs to go, God, and touch people's lives that need to be touched. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take a look at this video. I remember when I was young, going on my first Operation Christmas Child trip to South Africa and seeing a blind girl open her shoebox and all the gifts in her box were soft to the touch and made sound. And it was there that I realized the incredible impact each gift can have on an individual child's life. 
You want to go put a picture in each box? Now, when I pack a shoebox with my family, I think about the child who will receive my box. Shoebox gifts can trigger our physical senses, like sight, sound, touch, and smell. These senses play a key role in creating lasting memories for these children. I remember a young man who still recalls the fragrance of soap, and it takes him back to the day he first heard about the love of Jesus. Small musical gifts can help bring light to a child in a dark corner of the world. When a child holds a soft animal or doll, that soft touch can remind them that God truly cares for them. What a child sees can shape and inspire their imagination. And what if our gift gives them the chance to dream? For all of us, our senses help create and recall memories. And a shoebox full of gifts can help a child remember the love of Jesus. So this year, as you pack your box, pray and ask God what He wants you to pack, knowing that your prayer-filled shoebox will help children experience the greatest gift ever, the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. I look forward to seeing all those shoe boxes as they uh, come in. We already have a few here, so feel free to pack them and bring them whenever you get a chance to. My daughters are already uh, saying to me, when do we get to pack our shoe box? And I said, well, once you clean out your room. No, that's not how it's supposed to work. So find those toys, find those things that you can put in that shoe box and be able to uh, bring in, and uh, we'll be uh, setting them here. The last day is November 14th. That is the last, right, November 14th, Jackie? Right, last day is uh, November 14th for us to be able to bring those boxes in, so you can do that. All right, he is risen. Okay, I know it's early. I know it's cold. You're going to have to work with me here, right? We're, we're, we're here and doing this together. All right, let's try this again. He is risen. Ah, oh, that's the congregation I like to hear. All right, that's so good. I'm glad you're here with me. Whether you're right here in person or you're participating with us online, we're so grateful that you are here and a part of Palm Coast Bible Church. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 today. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and His movement in our lives and why that's so important. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to open up to that. I'll, I'll throw everything on the screens for you so you can follow along with me that way. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, you want to know more about what's going on, you just have some thoughts that you want to share, anything, uh, Feel free to call, text, email me. You see my information there on the screen. It's available for you online uh, also to do that. Hey, next week, we have something a little special for you next week. Um, we're going to jump out of this series that we're in. So we're, the series that we're in is called Conform to His Image. And next week, I'm going to be interviewing uh, an individual, um, a, a gentleman next week, whose passion is to make sure that the value of human life is shown throughout the world. Um, and so what he has done is he set up a nonprofit, he set up a ministry, if you will, um, that he um, helps to bring those that are caught up in human trafficking out of human trafficking. And so especially young women um, who are kidnapped or get, get caught up in that trafficking, and, and he helps to make that happen. So I'm going to be interviewing him next week, and we're going to hear about what God is doing and how God is moving. I look forward to that. It's going to be at both our worship gatherings, 830 and 1030. Um, so that's going to be a, a great thing. If you, ha if you have any questions about it, there's a handout, and I don't know where the handout went. It's not there anymore, so there's a handout somewhere, and... Okay, <laughs> um, so feel free to grab that handout, and, and we'll figure out where that is, but grab it on your way out. It'll probably be at the Welcome Center as you go do that uh, next week. All right, um, every now and then, a, a person or a company needs an image rehabilitation. You know what I'm talking about with this, right? Uh, this idea that they need to, um, uh, to, to make themselves look better, All right? They did something wrong or unappealing in the public eye, and they've gotten a lot of bad press. We, we've heard about these kind of things, haven't we? We've seen that. And so when this happens, they hire somebody called an image consultant. And what the image consultant does is it helps that uh, company or that individual, it helps them to, to improve their image through their appearance, their behavior, or their communication. I mean, what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the perception that others have of that person or company. I, I don't know about you, but I grew up um, uh, moving. 
quite a bit. I was an Air Force brat, so, so I moved into different towns. I gradu- By the time I graduated high school, I'd already gone to four different high schools, so this is how much I'd moved. And, and I can tell you, this idea of changing perceptions, it was nice, um, because if I had some type of, um, if, if, some, if, I, if I had done something really silly in middle school, which is the worst time of our lives, isn't it? Can we all agree with that? If I had done something really silly in middle school, well, I was just going to move schools, and so my image was going to change, right? You know what the problem with image consultants and trying to change what's on the outside is? It's the inside, right? I I didn't really change what was on the inside. I just changed the perception of people. You see, they don't, image consultants, they don't address the intrinsic issues that cause the image problem in the first place. For these companies, for these individuals, nothing in their ideology or their worldview changes so that the problem doesn't happen again. Nothing changes on the inside. So the outside, it's just window dressing, isn't it? I I find this is what makes Christianity such a compelling lifestyle, as we talked about last week, right? Because Christianity is more concerned with changing the inside than putting window dressing on the outside. Christianity is less about perception and more about relationship. Christianity is transformation from the inside out. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote it like this in Romans 12. He said, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God do what? Transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's perfect will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's right. And so because we are being transformed from the inside out, you will always hear me say one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, which is Colossians 127. And what does it say at the very beginning of Colossians 127? Right. And last week I told you to change that you to me. Christ lives in me, right? I want you to make sure you understand that. And this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So what does that mean to share in his glory? I mean, some of us think it means salvation, right? We get to go into heaven, we assure, and and that is part of it, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today, but the other, but the bigger part probably for us is that we get to share in who Jesus is, the, the image that he is. As we talked about last week, in God's economy of the world, the perfect image is is someone who is intimately connected to him at the very core of their being. Someone who embraces their destiny as a a mago dei. Everybody say a mago dei. Right? So more Latin, right? We've learned Latin. We have missio dei. Everybody say missio dei. That's the mission of God. So a mago dei is the image of God. We conform to him. Or as Jesus told us like this in Matthew 5, you are to be what? perfect, right? Last week we we discussed this perfection word, but you are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And Jesus isn't talking about without error for us because all of us have some form of error. All of us have made some kind of mistake at some point. What Jesus is talking about is talking about holiness. You are to be holy as God is holy. For human beings, holiness is a connection that brings forth transformation. It's a determination to think about the things of God. It's determination to think about the things of heaven and not the things of this earth. It's, it's choosing God's way of doing things. Or as the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, he said, Pursue righteousness and a godly life, along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you. Holiness for us is deciding that the way God wants to do things is so much better and higher than any plan we come up with on our own. It's, it's recognizing our need for God's perfection as opposed to our inadequacies. So instead of being conformed to this world, God is asking us to be conformed to his image. He's asking us to fulfill our destiny as a Mago Dei. And the more we conform to God's image, the more we unveil God's perfect plan for humanity. The, the problem, though, with, with conforming to God's image is, <clears throat> is we're kind of stubborn, aren't we? Aren't we stubborn people? 
If you know a stubborn person, point to them. No, don't do that. How many, how many times have you tried to force something on someone, but they just don't embrace the one thing that you know will make their lives better? I, I mean, just think about how often I bring up the Indianapolis Colts and mac and cheese and Skyline Chili. Yet none of you are convinced that that is a better life for you, are you? I mean, I mean, honestly, though, we do try to do this to people, don't we? we? We try to tell them you need to eat healthier, and if you would just eat healthier, it'd be better. We try to, to force proper financial planning on people. We try to force exercise, or, or maybe they're going through something that you, they need counseling, or they have an addiction they need to overcome, and so we try to force these things, and they, they just don't seem to get it. They just don't seem to, to embrace what they know their lives will be better, and it leads us to that famous phrase, right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, can you? Yeah. See, the reason why you and I are so hard to convince is that we think we know ourselves best. We don't need someone else telling us what to do or what's best for us. Yet, if I were to ask your friends and family, they would all say to you, yeah, I know you better than you do. Right? You know that's true. You know they know you better than you. And when it comes to being the person that God designed us to be, to living up to Imago Day, we struggle to let God tell us what's best for us. We want to make our own plans and we want to follow our own destinies. We want to treat ourselves, which is why this is always going to be the case. Following Jesus is a struggle to conform our wills to God's will. See, the thing is that the life-transforming power of Christ in you is accessible to everyone, but its actual effect on an individual's life depends on the extent to which that individual is open and submissive to the power of the Holy Spirit, to the influence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The power of the Spirit is not a relentless moral force asserting its way in our lives, irrespective of our wills. He's not going to force himself upon us. But the Spirit's potential to change our lives, <laughs> it depends on our willingness to fully yield to the Spirit's power and embrace the will of God. So the choice will always be there. Will we allow our lives to be dominated by our own thinking, or will we allow it to be controlled by the Holy Spirit? All life long, we will feel this tension between these two forces that are pulling us in opposite directions. And so what happens is, is in our attempt to conform to the image of God, in the midst of that tension, we created a system of rules and regulations to try to force us to do the right thing. We might even call this system image consultants, dressing up the outside without changing anything on the inside thing is, though, we can't regulate our way to conformity. You can't do that. I mean, this is, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 when he says this. He says, the law of Moses. I like that. The law of Moses. This is some regulations. This is the system that was created, right? The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the, what? Weakness of our sinful nature. I, I get it. We naturally want a law or a standard that earns our justif or justifies our worth as God's children. We like report cards. I mean, we didn't always like showing report cards to our parents, but we, we liked knowing how we were doing, right? We like box scores when the game is over, and we want to read those box scores or performance reviews that show us how well we are doing and where we need to improve. Can I just throw this out there, though? When it comes to God, <laughs> there is nothing we can do to make him love us any more or any less than he already does. Right? God loves us. He, last week, we talked about this idea that he likes you. We can't say that about everybody. But God loves and likes you to the fullest extent possible. And it's impossible for us to look at our report card and fix the sin that gives us a less than perfect image as a human. So the law, 
was created. And these laws and these standards, or if you will, we'll call them standards that were created by God, they were established to show us our sin and the need for God. It wasn't meant to be negative. The law never was supposed to be. It was meant to be directive, to point us to God's grace and power, to help us see how Imago Dei is the rich and satisfying life found in following Him. The law is good. But what happened is we allowed religion to corrupt the goodness in the law and what it means to conform to God's image. Religion is, is just an expression of a particular faith, and we, there are lots of religions out there, right? It's, it's not bad, actually. When used properly, it's, it's really good. But rules and regulations were created that determined whether we looked the part of being conformed. Think about that. Looked the part of being conformed. So we created a system that, helped us, um, that held us captive to our humanity because it only addressed the outside. We don't need more regulations. We need more freedom. Romans 8, 2 is how it says it. Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving... You, you notice how it says the life-giving, not the life-giving religion, not the life-giving law, not, right? The life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. I, I, I would say this, that living by the spirit is freedom from the corruption of religion. You see, our image is perpetually defeated and weakened when we submit to a religion of rules and regulations but we have life and freedom when we submit to following the Holy Spirit in faith. Living by the Spirit is the power to be Imago Dei. Everybody say Imago Dei. Imago Dei. So, Romans 8, 3, 4. God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like our bodies, like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that, we, so that the just requirements of the law, right? Remember, the law is good. The just requirements of the law would be satisfied fully for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. I mean, there's something freeing right now for me in this. As I'm, as I'm thinking of this, this is freeing me up, going, you, you mean I can, I can be who I'm supposed to be by following the Spirit? That's because the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is necessary to be conformed to Imago Dei. We need both the power of the Spirit and the truth of the law if we are going to conform to God's image. What happens, though, is many believers and many congregations have made this an either or rather than a both and we get we get power but i'm going to tell you power without sound teaching is vulnerable to shallowness and lack of discernment power <laughs> i'm in a disco now i mean this is great <laughs> i mean it's vulnerable to to, to lack of shallowness and lack of discernment. But, but doctrine, teaching without power, is vulnerable to dryness and spiritual blandness. Both power and truth, deed and word, experience and explanation, manifestation and maturity, they are both needed and are combined in our personal and corporate lives. When that happens, the Spirit is welcomed and Jesus is glorified. We are conformed to Imago Dei. See, a balanced, spirit-filled spirituality seeks to unite the mind and the heart instead of setting them in opposition. And when we love God with our minds and with our hearts, faith and feeling unite and reinforce each other. That's why the role of the Holy Spirit is so important. It's so central and dynamic to the Christian religion. Alistair McGrath, he was a fantastic theologian, and he wrote this down in one of his books. He said, he said, the Holy Spirit has long been the Cinderella of the Trinity. 
The other two sisters might have gone to the theological ball, but the Holy Spirit got left behind every time. I feel like that happens for us. But the problem is, is that the triune God is a relational being whose cosmic work of creation, redemption, and reconciliation intricately involve all three persons of the Godhead. The Spirit of God was present in the creation of the world. The Spirit of God reveals God's word and will and showers people with skill, leadership, and strength. For us, spirit-filled uh, spirituality is submitting to the work of the triune God and conforming us to his image. It's an inward look that produces Christ-like character and a spiritual maturity. It's an outward work that provides your divine design so that you can be equipped to connect people with God. Spirit-filled spirituality requires both kinds of feeling, fillings. We, we, need the, we need the fruit of the Spirit, that inward look, as well as the power of the Spirit, that outward work. Because purity and power work best together, and they reinforce each other. So allow the Holy Spirit to nurture and empower your life. <laughs> the church, you and I, right? It's not primarily a social economic institution. But we are a spiritual organism that must depend on personal and collective visitations of the Holy Spirit if we're going to continue our vitality. Uh, the body of Christ, us, consists of believers who encounter the Holy Spirit, and we might encounter Him in different ways due to our unique temperaments and experiences. I, I see it happen all the time. I, due to my temperament and experiences, and maybe this could be you too, when when I'm feeling moved by the Spirit, you know what happens to me? I raise my hand like this. <laughs> this is charismatic for me, right? But I'm here in worship one Sunday. I'm sitting right here. I'm standing, actually, because we're singing a song. I'm standing right here, and we're singing a song. And it's, I mean, the band is doing fantastic. And I'm, and, and I'm clapping, because I also clap. And I'm clapping. And I turn and look to my left, and there's this woman who was just on the floor, like full out, on the floor, hands up. I didn't know if I was supposed to call the paramedics or not. <laughs> because it's different for each of us, right? And if we don't have that collective understanding of that, we all profit when we welcome the balance of the diversity that the Holy Spirit provides. Because since the time of Pentecost, the Spirit's ministry of indwelling is given to every believer. Look, look what it says here in Romans 8. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the... Think about the things that pleases the Spirit. So what does it say? So, let your sinful, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to nurture us. Because this ministry, this calling that the Holy Spirit has, it's multifaceted. It has so many aspects, that, but, but three of the most essential ones is that it's a witness to Jesus Christ applying his redemptive work in human hearts. He works in us personally and progressively to conform us into the image of God. He is an active, personal presence in your life. I, I, I don't want us for a moment to think that the Holy Spirit just doesn't move anymore. He has an active personal pre uh, presence in your life. He assures you of the Father's love. He brings you personal fellowship with Jesus, and he transforms your character so that we can become a Mago Dei. Jesus called him the paraclete. It's a name that means one called alongside to help. Look, look what Jesus said here in John chapter 14. He said, but when the Father sends the advocate. I like that word, all right? So the, the Greek word there is parakletos, right? When the Father sends the parakletos as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. Uh, parakletos could be translated so many different ways. It's translated helper, it's translated comforter, counselor, advocate, intercessor, supporter, strengthener, 
I mean, tell me, how many times then this week did you need one of those things? <laughs> and each of these terms carries a different nuance of the Spirit's work in your life. He makes it possible for the people of God to be progressively conformed and transformed into the image of God. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 3. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all, who ha- all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect what? <laughs> you get to reflect the glory of the Lord when you're filled with the Spirit. And the Lord, who is Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are into His glorious image. See, a a strong spirituality desires the things of the Spirit. And it puts to death the, (laughs) the image consultant version of Christianity. Instead, it changes us from the inside, not by our personal will, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. The only way you and I experience real life and peace is when you let the Spirit of God control you. Why? Because if you don't let the Spirit of God control you, Galatians says this, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are, no under, you are no, not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, right? so when you're not directed, the results are very clear. And then the Apostle Paul lists like these this, and this is not an exhaustive list of sins by any means. There are many, many more, right? Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of uh, anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. I, I got to ask, as you look at this list, is anybody going, hey, I want one of those? No, none of us are asking that, right? There's nothing on that list that gives us real life and peace. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. Instead, be what? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the indwelling of the Spirit, each follower of Jesus has all of the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit adds God's personal presence and influence and power to live wisely. Choosing to be filled with the Holy Spirit is choosing to allow Him to control your life. Remember, you can't be forced to do anything. You must choose. And when you choose, the Holy Spirit gives you guidelines to follow that will empower you to make the most of every opportunity. What are those guidelines? It says it right here. But the Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. What is it to produce? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And here's the greatest part of that verse that we sometimes forget, right? Here's the greatest part of that verse. That there is no corruption of religion, there is no system, no image consultant version against those things. Now, th- this is where it gets tough for us, right? Because here's what I'm going to challenge you with this week. Right now, I want you to think back to your week. And you had moments this week where you might go, yeah, I probably didn't live according to the spirit inside of me this week. Could be something you said to your spouse. Could be something, could be a hand gesture that you gave to the car that cut you off. <laughs> Somebody back there must have had one. All right, could be, um, could, could be, a, it could be something you thought about someone. What if, what if in that moment this past week you'd used one of these things? Wouldn't that have made the most of that opportunity? Wouldn't that have been so much better? I mean, I'm already thinking of, of a way that I probably talked to my daughter at one point because she's 17 and frustrates me, right? And I'm already thinking, oh, have I just used a little bit of gentleness? That would have been a much different conversation. 
See, this is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Because a well-fed, conformed to the image of God's soul is filled with the Holy Spirit and lives a life of peace and power. We talked about this at the beginning, right? Colossians 1.27, Christ lives in you. The Christian life is the life of Christ in us. That's what it is. But without, without a moment-by-moment reliance on the Holy Spirit, this level of living is impossible. I mean, it's easy and it's comforting to reduce God to a set of standards, to, to theological inferences rather than a living person who can't be boxed in, who can't be controlled, who can't be manipulated by our agendas. I mean, there are common forms of biblical deism. You you heard me talk about that, that God is an absent landlord, that he doesn't communicate to us. But when we work with these assumptions, we close ourselves to the surprising work of the Holy Spirit. And we limit God's ability to move us and conform us into who he wants us to be. You see, when Scripture speaks of sending, of God sending His Son as a sacrifice, it's not simply speaking of God's desire to forgive us. Salvation is not simply a matter of being forgiven. God desires to free us from our humanity that so grips us and enable us to overcome the power of the sin in our lives. The only way for this to happen is to be Conformed to Imago Dei. Everybody say Imago Dei. Conforming to God's image takes place through the work of the Holy Spirit. Not being forced by the regulations of religion. See, the biggest mistake we make as Christians is believing we can exercise our way to a better Christian walk. If I just work harder at praying and read my Bible, maybe if I attend both worship gatherings on Sunday morning, or if I give more money, I'll be a better Christian. That we think to ourselves that if we're more disciplined, then we will be closer to God. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of benefit to proper discipline in our lives. I I have many disciplines that I engage in every week. But disciplines, exercise, or practices alone will not help us grow as disciples. We must be filled with the Spirit, if we are going to thrive as followers of Jesus. Filled with the Spirit, if we are going to embrace our destinies and be conformed to Imago Dei. Let's pray together. God, thank you. Thank you for sending your Spirit into our hearts and our minds. (laughs) It's not always easy for us. We... We so much want our own way of doing things, to live by our own humanity. And we're stubborn, God. You you know that about us. I don't know why I have to tell you that. But we are, we're stubborn people. And so, God, we, we ask you now. We willingly give of ourselves to you. We ask for for your spirit to come and indwell in us so that we can truly live the Christian life, the, the Christian religion, we can so that we can live as Christ in us, so we can be Christ-like. Thank you for being, (laughs) thank you for being our parakletos when we need it the most. Thank you for filling us with the fruit of the Spirit. Forgive us when we don't share it. But God challenge each and every one of us collectively as your body of Christ 
to be people who not only say we are Christians, not only look like we are Christians, but people who are being transformed from the inside by the power and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, conformed to your image, so that we are truly followers of the way. It's in your name. Amen. You know, as we celebrate communion, we celebrate this interesting moment in the disciples' lives. In John chapter 14, um, Jesus is explaining all of these things that are happening, and he's sharing about what's going to happen next, what the, 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 the crucifixion and the resurrection and all of that. Um, and, and he probably he probably hears the disciples' confusion and thinking in this. Because he looks at the disciples and he says, it's, it's important that I leave you. It's important that I go away. Because if I don't, you, you won't get the Holy Spirit. And I imagine this confusion because the disciples are seeing Jesus, they're seeing God himself perform all of these amazing miracles. They're, they're watching him raise Lazarus from the dead. They're watching him heal the lepers. They're, they're watching him make blind people see and deaf people talk. They're, they're seeing him offer the forgiveness of sin. And they're and they're probably thinking to themselves, why? Why, ha why do you have to leave? We don't want you to leave. Stay here with us. And Jesus says, if I don't, then the Holy Spirit won't come. And you know what that, you know what that challenges me with? <laughs> that Jesus went from being the miracle to providing the ability for each and every one of us to live as though Christ is in us. To live Imago Dei. So the crucifixion, the atonement of Jesus, that's so that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. As we celebrate this today, may you celebrate the Holy Spirit's filling in your life. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat this, remember what I've done for you. Let's eat together. You know, not only did he make it so the Spirit could fill your life, he made it so the Spirit could fill our lives collectively as one. That we are one in Christ because the Spirit moves in us. <laughs> so I think about that as he took the cup, which signified the shedding of his blood. And as he said, this is the cup of the everlasting covenant. This is my blood shed for you. And that word you is a plural you, right? It's the southern y'all, okay? Shed for you, for the forgiveness of sin. <laughs> That's how we become one, by forgiving the iniquities that exist within us so that we can be the body of Christ. Every time you drink this, remember what he's done for you. Let's drink together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love, for your sacrifice, for, for the sending of the Holy Spirit into our hearts and our minds. Thank you that we are transformed because of you, made in your image. And it's in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Well, I pray that you experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life that brings us true joy so that you can then extend that joy to those that you encounter today. Let's stand together and sing one last song. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Since you have his joy, you may shout with it. Since you have his joy, you may shout with it. Since you have his joy, you may shout with it. Since you have his joy, shout with it. All right. You have a choice, right? It's not going to be forced upon you. I can't make you. You're not my minor anymore, right? I can still make my kids do some things. But you have a choice, right? Are you going to... Are you going to Want one of those, those, those nasty things that we saw up on the screen there, right? All those sins like these? Or are you going to live being filled and controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can be the image of God, so that you can share in His glory? I, I hope you choose the Spirit. There's no better life, I promise you, no better life than the one that is controlled by the Spirit. Have a fantastic week. I look forward to seeing you next week. And remember this, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it.